Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. I spent a considerable amount of time on the wrong side of the law, and as such, I've dealt with a lot of prosecutors. Never did I ever think I would be friends with one of them. And now, one of my best friends is a former DA. He's also an objectivist philosopher. He's an author of The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics and Creating Christ. You can see them both behind him. And he's the administrator of the oldest Ayn Rand group on Facebook, my friend, Mr. James Stevens Valiant. Welcome back. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, always an honor to be with you, my dear friend. Thank and, you. Yeah. Um, we, we, the, it may seem paradoxical that I spent so many years of my life being a public prosecutor. You <laughs> spent so many of your years of your life in prison that we should be even friends. But I think it's a lesson about what really counts, human character and shared yes, value. Sir. I'm I'm with you there. I agree with you. Okay, so what, when you're a kid and you decide, you know, all of us, what do you want to be when you grow up? What ultimately led you to the decision to become a, a prosecutor? Well, I have to say that if you'd asked me at the age of 11, after I discovered Perry Mason, I was 11 years old and I discovered Perry Mason, literally. This was before Ayn Rand recommended Perry Mason or anything to me. I, I just loved Perry Mason. At the time, I was also a sincere Christian. <laughs> if you'd asked me at the age of 11, I would have told you, I'm either going to be a clergyman or a, a professor of theology or something, or I'm going to be a lawyer. And once I lost the religion bit, it only took about a year more before, a year and a half more before I lost all the religion that I became an atheist overnight, it was still the lawyer bit. Because in both departments, I found myself loving the arguing. And I found that, hey, what is it that I'm really into when I'm arguing with someone, even if I'm dead wrong about the existence of God? I love this engagement. I love talking about ideas. And although I learned and I corrected big mistakes about it. It was that engagement process that was part of what taught me. And more than that, I uh, enjoyed, I, there's justice too. I hated bullies, just hated bullies. Um, my only one physical interaction when I was a kid with someone at school, I gave the guy a bloody nose and he de deserved it because he was you know, picking on smaller, weaker, and it just, that bugged me. And so there, let me put it this way, I had a series of experiences, too, that made me sort of committed to justice uh, in a big way. And yes, I do advertise loudly my books, but in a sense, my first book was all about doing justice to Ayn Rand when I felt that she'd been the victim of an unjust smear by people who had a very big interest in smearing her that way. And uh, so I wanted to come to her defense. And in a sense, my first book is kind of like a prosecutorial closing argument uh, on the sub, marshal the evidence and then make my argument. And um, I was committed to being an attorney. You know, I was in Leonard Peikoff's seminar, uh, OPAR seminar, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, his great treatise, highly recommend the book. Before it was published, he invited several of us to come to his home on Saturday evenings, some Saturday evenings, uh, to give comments and feedback. And on one of those nights, he set me, took me aside and he said, Jim, and what to one of the nicest compliments I ever got, Jim, you really seem to understand objectivism. Why, do, why not become a philosopher? Why not be, get, get a PhD in philosophy, teach? And I said, no, 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 no. You're not going to see the effect of your work in your lifetime. Um, I need to see, get that verdict back. I need to do justice. And I need to see my, the effect of my own effort. And he said, I respect that. I understand that. And I knew I would come back around to some form of teaching, to, to writing stuff. I knew I had some books in me, as they say. Um, and that was always what I was also working on whenever I had free time as a prosecutor. And you don't have a lot of free time as a prosecutor, a high pressure job, because you want to do it right and you want to be exact about it. But I was glad I chose to be, you know, I, I clerked at a big law firm in downtown L.A., uh, one of the really big, fancy old law firms in downtown L.A. and one of those skyscrapers. And we were doing the asbestos litigation, you know, and they had thousands of expert uh, uh, depositions there. I knew I didn't want to be that kind of lawyer. God, I, that, it was that experience. Where I, <laughs> I went up in the elevator with Henry Kissinger one day. One of the partners <laughs> of the firm was uh, Jimmy, uh, was uh, Bill Clinton, one of Bill Clinton's secretaries of state, was a partner at the firm. And uh, so that's how fancy the law firm was. I knew I did not want that. I did not want to do federal government work either. So I chose, because they did most of the murder cases, most of the domestic violence cases, 
Those were the people, the child abuse cases. That's where I wanted to, to do justice on that level. Most federal prosecution, in my mind, is corrupt and evil. I was not going to do immigration. I was not going to do taxes. I was not going to do these economic regulations, work for the SEC. Uh -uh, no way. Um, I would be an agent of evil in my mind to take most federal jobs, honestly. That's how I saw it. And uh, obviously, Ayn Rand is already having an impact on me. And so for me to, and then I thought to myself, could I defend murderers if I was a defense attorney? I know I want to be the guy in court because that's the fun stuff. It requires the most training and the most discipline to be the guy in court. Absolutely. And so it's the most demanding. But I wanted to have that fun. And I did. And I wanted to be the guy most of the time on the right side of things. And so I said that would be prosecution. Um, and that's why I decided to become a prosecutor. And it turned out that was the case. Uh, I was the good guy. I believed in my cases. So I could, so when I, I loved the work, I would get up in the morning, just enthusiastic. I got to get there. Couldn't get there quick enough. I get to get in my white Honda. And I always saw myself as Prince Valiant on his white steed <laughs> going to do justice in the morning because I really felt it was challenging. It was rewarding. I felt like I was doing justice. I felt like I was making my community a safer place and doing real justice. When you're talking to those victims, you get the real sense of justice when you talk to the mother of a murder victim, okay? And you look her in the eyes and you promise you're gonna do your best to see that justice happens for her son. That is a powerful, powerful thing. And, uh, and boy, in my almost 18 years there at the district attorney's office, um, I learned so much and it confirmed so much about objectivism to me in so many different ways. Uh, it was a remarkable experience in that I felt not only the rewards from doing the work, but I was constantly learning and, and chewing and objectivism was becoming a real thing to me as, that I could see in the concrete parameters of the difference in the principles as Ayn Rand spoke about them abstractly. So just take one example, reason. Look, you don't lie because all of reality is interconnected. Reason is to be adhered to, and you have to integrate all your concepts uh, uh, into a consistent whole, or none of those, the one of those concepts is valid, says Ayn Rand. This demand for total integration because everything is interconnected. Well, if I reached a point of certainty, let's say my inferences, deductive and in inductive, during the course of an investigation, but prior to charging someone, led me to believe that he was guilty. And I achieved rational certainty on that regard. I, at first, I was sort of, okay, we're going to find evidence that's going to blow up in my face. The new evidence we find is going to, no, more and more and more, I grew confident in the power of reason. And when a valid inference is made from facts, you have nothing to fear from any new facts. Any new facts you will find will, in fact, confirm, and this is what happened over and over and over and over. And so, for example, the defense would say, oh, we've got some something up our sleeve, ha, 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 ha. And if I knew the guy was guilty, right? If I had evidence that gave me certainty in the person's guilt, that never, ever could faze me. After a while, my confidence was so such that I knew that reality is so interconnected that his lie would be interconnected to a dozen other lies and uh, so let me put it this way, my, my conf sure, I understood the power of reason and the validity of reason from philosophical arguments like those of Ayn Rand. And I could see it in personal ways before that and in a simple way. But now it was investigating criminal cases that really drove home to me the power of reason, the absolute of reality. How reason does give us reality if we're using reason right. And uh Reason is our only means of knowing. But when you have achieved certainty, you have achieved certainty. Uh, reality, don't worry, reality will be consistent. Uh, a will be A. So you learned a lot from the job, and you said a lot of it confirmed and expanded your understanding of objectivism. What about it, if anything, I'm assuming there has to be, did you learn and confirm about human beings on all sides of the law? I mean, an objectivism, for instance, free will, volition, very fundamental in the view of human beings. The idea of justice, that people should get what they, they deserve. It, did you learn anything about that while you were a prosecutor? 
Holy moly. Well, once more, again, it's like reason. Of course, Ayn Rand sort of got in my head a good idea about free will and what it was. And I could think it, it'd do a little introspecting and that made sense inside my head. But it was, you know, still a tentative understanding. When I began to work with both good guys, really good guys, and some really bad guys, I began to understand volition in an entirely different way. <laughs> Perhaps the most eloquent, I had always opposed drug laws, uh, and I avoided the narcotics unit when I, you know, it was pretty early on, I could choose what specialty I wanted to go into. And I would always go into the domestic violence or the child abuse unit, um, you know, units like the, even the appellate unit. I would avoid the drug, the major narcotics unit for many reasons. I didn't trust those cops, as I've, I think I've explained to you before. I think that's where most of the corruption in law enforcement comes from is drug money. And so, and there was a case in which detectives were caught stealing drugs and cash from a drug dealer here in San Diego County when I was uh, the DA, M made national news at the time, those effing corrupt cops. Anyway, it's the drug laws that are behind that. So I wasn't involved in that. But when people were talking about non-incarceration alternatives for drug addicts, I jumped on it and I became the developer of the first drug court. Uh, uh, I said, no, 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 now there's a task in, the, in drugs that I'll take. Can I start the first drug court here? in my courthouse. And they said, go for it, Jim. And uh, I tried, now obviously coerced uh, treatment is just not always gonna work because you have to be willing and ready. If the person's not ready and willing, <laughs> then it's, it's not gonna work, I promise you. And a lot of the people went into the program just to avoid jail when they weren't really ready or willing <laughs> to do it. And so we had some problems that way, but I was still looking for non-incarceration alternatives for people who were there uh, on drug offenses, so long as they didn't have a violent, and that was my test. If, you have a, if you're on probation for a felony, if you've got a violent felony in your background, I don't want it, but if it's really just drugs, uh, let's get you into a drug program. And working with the drug addicts, they had to waive their confidentiality so that the judge and the prosecutor actually could read and talk to their counselors every week when they went to AA and they went to one-on-one -on -one counseling and when they went to group sessions, I would sometimes go to the group sessions. <laughs> and so they let me in on the confidentiality and all that. And so let me tell you the story. I think I've told you this story. I would talk to a heroin addict, someone who'd been a heroin addict for quite some time and a very serious heroin addict. I mean, if this person did not get their heroin, they would be throwing up, they would be shaking, they couldn't think straight. They would, there's gonna be serious issues if they don't get their heroin. Um, so I ask, now wait, no matter what condition of need you're in for your heroin, if the police officer is standing there on the corner right in front of you, can you manage not to shoot up? And the addict would always say, yes, Mr. Valiant, absolutely. But the cop standing right, of course not. I'm not going to shoot up. I don't care how blurry my consciousness is. I'm able to avoid shooting up and right in front of the cop. Aha. So it's the cognitive awareness of the cop's presence that can actually overcome however deep your habit is, whatever the psychology, whatever the habituation, whatever the physical addiction even. Wow, and that really impressed me because I thought the physical addiction was, you know, really this powerful drive. Uh, yes, Mr. Valiant, ah, I see. Well, when we started this whole thing, uh, Mr. Addict, you told me the reason why you want tr uh, drug treatment is because you lost your job, you lost your girlfriend, you wanna think straight, Forget getting caught by the cops. You're just sick of being sick and you want to be able to hold a job and a girlfriend and you want to be able to think straight when you want to think, be able to think straight. OK, well, those are very good motives to, 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 to be off uh, drugs. Can't those motives operate like the cop there? I wondered to myself. And so I asked the question, well, then what's the difference? You tell me last weekend you were in your apartment with your buddy and you did shoot up and you relapsed. So what's the difference between the cop standing there on the corner and you being there with your buddy on Saturday night in your apartment alone shooting up? Well, there were these pressures going on. And I, and besides, my buddy, I hadn't seen him in a while. Oh, yeah, uh, forget all that. Mr. Valiant, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking. Because then I'd review the, oh, remember your girlfriend? Remember the job? Remember wanting to think straight? Remember all the things that got you here into counseling? Right. Well, I wasn't thinking about that. I didn't have that in my head. And so one of the great phrases the counselors would use is play the tape forward, play the tape forward to the consequences. 
See, because then I'd ask the guy, did shooting up with your buddy? Well, yeah, I mean, we felt swell that night. But did that make matters worse or better? Oh, well, of course, it made matters worse. And it sure didn't help me solve the problem I wanted to solve. Oh, OK. So it's a fa- so the, then we fast forward to when he succeeds. How did you manage? I was there. I was under pressure. Oh, I had this job interview. I didn't know whether I was going to get the job. I was really under some stressors. So do I do the drugs? My friend comes over. He says he's got some. Huh, huh, huh. Do I do the heroin or not? I played the tape forward, Mr. Valiant. I thought about it. I thought about the consequences in the future. And yeah, it was driving me crazy. And so I called my, you know, I'm not a big fan of 12-step programs, as you may know. I think there's some problems with that. But he called his, uh, you know, the person he could call in his 12-step program, you know, the guy who who was always going to be there for him to get him sponsor thank you for giving us the uh, <laughs> that's what they call them folks sponsors he, he called his sponsor and that got him through the first couple nights uh, and he was like okay now i can now i'm better and this is what really happened seeing it over a year the failures the successes and why they were failures and why they were successes and then attending the graduation say after a year and a half and we could dismiss their criminal case because they'd successfully completed the program and been clean for a certain period of time. And I was so happy to dismiss those cases in cases where I saw that free will had turned this person around. See, I believe in what you did. I believe that that's possible. No matter how bad a person is, they can still turn it around. Now, how do we do that? We are beings, as Ayn Rand says, of self-made soul. And the people that turned it around were the people who went into put on their construction gear and went in there with the hammers and the nails to restructure their souls because they could see that th- the thinking the right way would lead to acting the right way, which would re- lead to a ha- good habit, which would then lead to good character. And then they realized character is destiny. And boy, another lesson the DA's office taught me. Character is destiny. This guy, we can't prove the case this time on him. Plenty, huh? It took him only two months, huh? To reoffend and do or do some other offense. Because after all, character I learned over and over and over is destiny. And that we shape ourselves through our own thinking, our own acting, and that's what creates a character, a moral character. And um that's what we mostly rely upon. That's when people can become as predictable as they can be. But as I say, people can change. I saw good people, too, go bad. Hold on with that, because I'm going to get to that in a few. But I want to back up a little bit to your drug addict and the police officer right in front of him. Mm-hmm. I remember reading a book called Understanding Objectivism. And it was a, a book form of a course that Leonard Peikoff had taught. And he talked about how nobody tries to evade reality at a concrete level. Meaning if I see a Mack truck coming, I don't just walk in front of it and assume that I'm going to be okay. That I know that truck's going to crush me. But when you're dealing on a conceptual level, you're dealing with principle, the effects aren't always immediate. So if I tell you a lie right now, I might not get caught. I might get away with this lie. Hell, I might get away with the next one. But the point right. is, eventually, I'm going to end up hurt by it. And so Peekoff talked about in there in, in that book or in the course making your concepts concrete so that you understand them on a concrete level. So the impacts immediate. And that's what that reminds me of when you talked about the police officer, because if the drug addict can keep that operative, that police officer standing in front of him, then he doesn't have to cave. And I just wonder if that, because I know you've taken the course, if that specific lesson from Leonard Peikoff, if you were applying it in, in that concrete situation. I, I not only took the course, I took it live when he gave it 1983 in New York City. I was there sometimes in the front row, <laughs> if I could manage it. <laughs> so I took that course live and it had, of all of Leonard Peikoff's courses, the one that just autobiographically for me had the biggest impact was that course because it corrected all the misunderstandings that the Brandons and the Rothbards had filled my head with. Oh, that working with those libertarians at Laissez Faire Books that filled my head with. Um, le- suddenly, I had a whole new understanding of objectivism, and it permitted me to continue 
uh, investigating it as, yeah, this is something I want. I mean, I'd already integrated aspects of it into my life, but I was hesitant about the whole system. Um, and like I say, I could see it, some of these things on a superficial level. But get this, Michael, not only am I seeing the power of learning to make an abstraction concrete in the case of the addict, and that's what I'm trying to do when I say play the tape forward. I'm trying to get him to see the rest of the concrete reality of what is otherwise a floating abstraction for him when he is shooting up. Absolutely good, good comparison. For him, the long term is sort of an abstraction. Now, for you and I, that might seem like sort of a low level or mid level abstraction uh, rather than the, but Leonard says the highest abstraction, if you if you know it properly, should be as clear to you as, a, as seeing a truck. So make them truck like no matter how abstract, no matter how theoretically removed from reality they may seem. And in my case, watching that. So here we have the addict learning how to make a concept truck like. And that's what helps him get over it. And now look at what's happening to me. Suddenly, truck-like is becoming the concept of volition and human character. And so what's happening to me is actually the concretization of this whole process itself. <laughs> and so in my mind, the, the character development, the relationship between values and emotions, I mean, how many psych... I've read thousands upon thousands of forensic psych reports. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not work in child abuse or domestic violence for a while. Of course, and in every felony case where they apply for probation, there has to be a psych report in California. Okay, I have read thousands and thousands of psych reports, no exaggeration. And I began to see that there were causal um, associations uh, between, say, a background and a certain outcome. But I could also see that there were other causal associations that could have a totally different effect. We're choosing the cause that, in fact, you told this, this, I talk about something that I've read hundreds of times, but you said so beautifully, there was a point when you were about 16 or 17 and you were aware that you were in effect choosing a criminal lifestyle. Now, you didn't think it through. No, of course, it wasn't a full awareness of it. But yeah, you knew you were doing at some level something wrong, and you should have probably looked into that a little more <laughs> introspectively. There is this uh, this understanding of psychology really began to cognitive behavioral, we call it. But this understanding of psychology really began to sink with me. I began to see how people really selected the reasons that would motivate them to do what they would do. And sometimes they would do it through a back door of evasion so that they didn't have to bring it to their direct awareness. But it was a kind of evasion, a kind of mental evasion that you could trace it to almost every time at some point where someone had that moment where, yeah, I'm mature enough now, I could have known different and I thought about it and uh, I don't wanna think about it or I'm not gonna consider that or, I'm, or this feels better, Fe this feels better. And a lot, you know, I have sympathy. Uh, you know, part of me has sympathy. Given your abusive background uh, and believe me, so much of the guys who beat their women, people who molest children, eight, nine times out of 10, they saw daddy beat mommy or they themselves were a victim of some kind of child abuse. Now, on the other hand, I saw thousands and thousands of people who were the victims of horrific child abuse who never turned out to be child abusers themselves. In fact, most people who are victims of child abuse, the vast majority, of people who are victims of child abuse don't become child abusers. Now, how did they manage that? Now, so, uh, and guess what? <laughs> Our psychiatrists can't fix pedophilia. They don't know the first thing about how to fix pedophilia. They really don't. But when I saw people who didn't do it, it was an act of extraordinary will. They were working with psychiatrists and they were practically if necessary, you know, it's like the scene from the Wolfman with Lon Chaney. They're practically chaining themselves to the to the <laughs> to their rooms so that they don't look at kitty porn or don't do it. And they'll take whatever steps are necessary to control their own character. And in the cases where it worked, in the cases where it didn't work, what were they doing? They weren't thinking. They were succumbing to emotion. Because once we've convicted you, I know you know, because I've given you the lecture on how you've hurt this child for the rest of their life. I called the expert and I saw your face when the expert told you the harm you'd caused this seven-year-old child. 
So don't tell me you don't know or have good reason at least to believe what you're doing is harmful at that point. You're evading that. You're evading harm to a child and giving into your feelings. And I can't tell you these feel. And it's a choice. It is still a choice. I ha I, it was the most extraordinary lesson in human free will. It really was. In the, in the, it's not the validity of free will. Of course, it's axiomatic. <laughs> you either know you that, that thought takes an effort or you don't from the inside. That's the direct validation. And you're really gonna, not going to get any more validation than that if you want an ultimate validation. On the other hand, the nature of free will, what it is, how it works in our life, how we can use it to shape our character one way or another, and how that character becomes our destiny. Boy, that lesson got that literally, as I say, thousands of cases that drove that lesson about human nature home to me again and again and again. Miss Rand was right about human nature, about the nature of emotions, about the nature of character, about thought being volitional and the key to it all. And the key to building character is rational thought and a commitment to reason. The power of reason. Again, not the validity of reason, because it takes reason to, to see the nature and how it's working out successfully. But again, it's the nature of reason and how it operates in human life that really became clear to me. Miss Rand, from my concrete experience at the DA's office, nailed it. Nailed it about the relationship between human consciousness and reality. It's just that simple. When you work in law enforcement, you, that's about as powerful as outside of being a king that, that's that's power whether it be a, a prosecutor a, a cop you're making decisions about people's lives right some frightening power right. i felt that every time i charge someone with a felony michael do you know what it feels like to go into court and file a piece of paper where you know you're changing another human being's life you're asking that their liberty be taken away for years at a time charging a human being with a felony crime is a serious moral responsibility. And if you don't take it that seriously, I mean, life and death serious, if, I mean, I don't think I could live with myself, Michael, if I believed that anyone I'd ever convicted of a felony was wrongfully convicted. I couldn't live with myself. The, the consequences to their life would just be too horrific. I'm so glad that, no, that there's never been any evidence that to reverse any of my convictions because I, I, I just don't know if I could live with myself. That's why I was always so demanding of the detectives. The det I had a reputation among the detectives for being fastidious. Let me put it this way, detailed. You mean you didn't get the, you mean that wasn't on tape? You mean we don't have a videotape of that? No, no, where what, did you have that? Now show me the corroborate. No, 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 no. You're going to have to go back and get the, no, I need a supplemental report on. I need to know with certainty and I sometimes, well, I knew that most of my colleagues were not objectivists. They did not have the strict standard for rational certainty, a respect for evidence and evidence alone is the basis. And can you reduce each proposition to the evidence in an overwhelming way such that it integrates across the board and you are certain that this person is, and so I would have, I had a benevolent impact, I think, on the charging of crimes uh, within my arm's reach, when people would ask me and people would come up and ask me in the DA's office, what do you think about charging this guy? And I would give them my opinion. But I had a reputation for being tough on cops, making them do the, all their work, making sure I was certain. And, you know, it, it's a terrible thing sometimes because I'm across my desk alone in my office with a woman who sincerely sounds like she was raped. But I can't, it's so far now just a he said, she said, and that can't be proof beyond a reasonable doubt, can it, Michael? No. Uh, no, it can't. And so I have to explain to a woman who may well have, and looking at her face, Michael, if it was going by her face, I believe her. And so I have to tell a woman who may well have been raped, Michael, we cannot file the charge. And then there's the other side of it a woman who was raped and we can physically prove it and prove it was him with DNA beyond a reasonable doubt. It was him. We, we found her bloody on the street and he, his DNA was in her. Okay. We've got him dead to rights and there's no way wiggle room out convincing her to go forward. 
I don't want to go through the trial, Mr. Valiant. This is just going to re-traumatize me. Her sister comes in. Her counselor comes in. We're just going to re-traumatize. Now, Mr. Valiant, what are you going to do? Re-traumatize the victim? No, now I explain, try and explain to the victim, we've got to stop this guy. He's going to do it again. Please, 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 please. Maybe it'll help you get closure. Maybe it'll help you get past it. Maybe begging her to go forward. But And with ch child abuse victims, God, the other hell side of this equation, looking at mom and dad, when your kid has been molested, but I can't prove that it's this guy who we think did it, but I can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, there's some indication he did it, but I need to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to a unanimous jury. I have to be certain, and I have to have enough evidence so that I can go to a judge on appeal and say, this was totally reasonable by the jury to prove, to say it was certain. We had his taped confession. We had his DNA. We had his fingerprints on the stolen property. That's the kind of evidence I need as a prosecutor. That's what I need. And um, it's rough as hell because we have a system in which I had to tell many times women I thought probably were raped. We just can't go forward with the case or begging victims, begging victims to go forward with a case where we had them dead to rights. Those are some of the morally challenging aspects of being a prosecutor. I can I can tell you those are the morally challenging ones. Well, hold on one second. So the, the, this is actually what I wanted to ask you, because you have a, a strong moral core. But it's been said, of course, by Lord Acton, that power corrupts. And being around these powerful people, did you see a tendency? Is, is that true? Does the power actually corrupt? Yeah. I mean, over time, over time, you develop certain attitudes about people. And some of the entrenched attitudes I saw in 20, 30 year prosecutors who had made it their careers <laughs> um, was sometimes disturbing to me because they began to develop very entrenched attitudes about protecting their position as the DA. That was as important. No, 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 no. Nothing is more important than the individual justice in this case. And the DA's office, uh -uh. no considerations about the office. I'm just going to leave it. You can, I think you can fill in about a hundred different kind of scenarios there, right? No, no, it's justice. It's justice to this defendant and it's justice to my victim. And that's all that matters. And if we let any consideration about what's good for the office trump that, I'm out. That's evil. That's evil. That is power corrupting on a subtle level. We have, fortunately, though, a system of all kinds of checks and balances. We do have courts of appeals that can correct prosecutorial misconduct. We have independent agencies, state agencies that could come in and look over the shoulder of uh, local law enforcement. We have some mechanisms of protection. Thank God we have the Bill of Rights. Thank God we can't get forced statements from people. Thank God we can't torture people for confessions and stuff. <laughs> that the hearings need to be public. That they have a right to a jury trial. <laughs> I mean, all these rights in the Constitution are absolutely vital. And But for them, the rule of Lord Acton would turn these people into medieval lords. I'm absolutely certain. Some of them. Now, most of the people, let me just also say, now that I've given you a sort of a scary thing, especially these old entrenched guys who are trying to protect their position in their office more than do individualized justice that i found horrific but most prosecutors even the ones that had devoted their lives to it were 20 30 year prosecutors were good people and they may have been mistaken some of them were deeply religious people some of them were conser politically conservative as you can imagine working in law enforcement and i'm going to say something that may surprise people it was those people that i that were the good ones that oftentimes were the ones who would not let the power corrupt them because they had some moral and I would not, I couldn't like me, they couldn't live with themselves. If, if they did, if they cut any corner in justice, um, they just couldn't have lived with themselves. You know, the other thing about free will too, is I would go out to the lifer hearings in go out to our state prisons in California. Some of them are out in the middle of the desert and this is really just, 
110 in the summertime. <laughs> not, a, not a fun place. Thank God there's air conditioners out there without any violation of the Eighth Amendment, it seems to me. <laughs> Cruel and unusual. But, but I'd drive out to the, to the desert, to the state prisons, go into the prisons and be the DA there handling San Diego County's, uh, you know, uh, life or hearings for parolees. And these are people, it's not just murder. Uh, California at that point already had three strikes law and the one strike law so that some people who had serious records or, uh, um, and sometimes the, the, the times were mandatory, but there are a variety. But even if you're there for murder, let's say, do we let the guy out for this second degree murder that happened 20 years ago? Now on that, those kind of cases, Again, prosecutors, most of the prosecutors I know walked up there with an automatic, no, 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 no. Keep him in, 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 keep him in. I was sort of unique because I would have spent the last several days fretting over the entire big thick file on each and every one of them to make, again, an individualized decision about the lifers in California State Prison. Uh, before I would recommend say no, the people of the state of California still oppose his parole. Um, and with a life sentence, you can be on parole for life. So I always had that in my head too, because look, we're not, even if we let him out, we're still going to have a string on him. <laughs> if he's in California, we still have him on a string to some extent. Um, but I believe in individualized justice if that makes sense and that made me unique i understand as a prosecutor most prosecutors were eager to prosecute drug laws and prostitution laws i felt it offensive boy when i was doing issuing when i would issue cases for the in north county for the da's office the undercover prostitution detectives hated me <laughs> they just hated me because they would practically get naked with the you know Asian escort in their massage parlor, they'd be practically commit the crime with them. And I was like, I'm not going in front of a jury. I mean, you got buck naked in front of the. I mean, you man. Well, you did practically the act. <laughs> you know, so in Les Miserables, yes, sir. In Les Miserables, they they describe Victor Hugo describes the detective Javert. And he said he's steadfast, he's diligent. He, he, you know, when he has somebody in his sights, he goes after him, he doesn't stop, he's gonna get his guy. Relentless. He, he's <laughs> relentless, he's in, in in full conviction that he's right. And then Hugo says the only problem is he might be wrong. Have you come across prosecutors or, or police? that met that sort of description that were people i guess javier openly is a person of high character he he, he sticks to principle yeah. yeah he just does he closes his mind off to out you know to, to outside information well just consider javier in the context of the story he is a man of high principle but old-fashioned principle yeah. Should he be relentlessly hunting down Jean Valjean, even knowing all the good that he's doing in the world for the same damn loaf of bread yeah. year after year? Come on. Now, at some point he has to his context is he's it's it's not just that he's not being Christian, which is what Hugo is. Be merciful and Christian it would be Hugo's, I think, uh, soft heart. Uh, but I would say it's not even justice. Javert should we should be just as iron in our dedication to the principle of justice as javert his principle of justice was all messed up it was intrinsicist it was a religious view of uh justice i'm going to track jean valjean i don't care how where he goes how long it takes or if he saves the france in the process i'm still going to get him for this damn loaf of bread okay and so it's like okay maybe your concept of justice is a little warped there uh javert and but the truth but that's the way i would analyze it it's his concept of justice that's so messed up it's not that we need to temper our either see it, both sides of this equation are wrong uh, right <laughs> it's not mercy right nor is it actually when you're is he actually strictly applying justice that's the misunderstanding here true justice means we take into account all the facts it's contextual um, and if we don't have a contextual understanding of justice, it must be. Now, I did see there were multiple cases, okay, and 
please do not make me give you the names or details on this. But more than once, a pro I had a good reputation among my colleagues too, and they would come to me for questions. Um, and when I was working in appellate, I had to answer their legal questions because we were the legal lawyers for the lawyers. And so they'd come to me with questions and I'd say, um, I have a doubt about whether your guy did it, or I have a doubt about your application of the law here. So when, lo and behold, at some hearing before trial, the judge says, hmm, I have a doubt about your evidence here, or I have a doubt about your application of law here, they would come running to me and say, ah, oh, you were right, you were right, you were right. And I say, what we do now is we don't dig in our heels, and because as a matter of pride, we go with the facts, or we go with the law, and we just swallow it. OK, there were because I had this attitude, get this, Michael, because I had this attitude when prosecutors had to dismiss a case that they had filed, they were the special DA. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't make the decision, but they had filed the case and they knew they had to dismiss it. Very often they would hand it. Would, would you go into court and dismiss it? I don't want to. I was happy to. And I would be the guy who say the people are dismissing the case of. Lack of evidence, Your Honor insufficient legal basis your honor because they didn't have the balls to <laughs> excuse me the courage the backbone whatever it was to dismiss the case that they had against my advice filed anyway and down the road uh thank goodness there were checks and balances when that situation happens and you're in the middle of trial yeah i saw that happen a couple of times where i just look at them now you've impaneled it you better have the backbone to go into court and say i dismiss Boy, it takes some backbone once the jury's been sworn and you're in there in trial, you're committed. It's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to the prosecutor who got that far, in my view. But you take the bull by the horns and you, truth and justice first. And if I have to be the one to do it, I'll do it on behalf of our office. That's how I felt about it. God, I, I'm, you know... I've been years now away from it. I had to quit because of health reasons. Um, being a trial lawyer is very demanding physically and psychologically. Um, and uh, I came to a point where I realized I just couldn't do that work anymore. But in the years since I've been away from the office, interacting with judges and both the defense bar and the former uh, my former colleagues at the DA's office, or U.S. attorneys or FBI agents or San Diego police officers, uh, I... I'm very proud of the reputation that I developed, a uh, reputation for being both tough on violent crimes and being understanding about the context of facts and being strict about the legal rights of defendants so that defense attorneys respected me, prosecutors respected me, and judges, uh, one judge was really funny, uh, Mr. Valiant, I open, my entire staff and I always sighed a, a sigh of relief when you walked in the doors that we knew you were going to be our prosecutor because we knew it would go smoothly and fairly. What was the biggest case you ever tried? I mean, big as far as media and the, and the whole. Uh... I did some murder cases that really, one of them was on the front page of the San Diego Reader. Um, and uh, it was a. a, a you know, one of the other things, you know, we, we haven't talked about deeper philosophical issues. All kinds of political issues became really crystal clear in my head. Talk about legalizing drugs or something, knowing things about this, or knowing that, for example, guns don't cause crime or poverty doesn't cause crime. Uh, this case got some national attention, and it was on the front page of the San Diego Reader. Um, uh, a very rich man in Rancho Santa Fe was murdered by his son for the money. This kid was a spoiled little parasitical brat his whole life. And when it looked like daddy was going to cut him out of the will, he took a trip, even if it took him a couple hundred miles to get back home to San Diego County to murder his dad in the backyard. Um, and uh, we convicted him of murder and he's still in state prison. That spoiled, but see, poverty doesn't cause crime. Um, I Many a time did I see poor people have a far more principled attitude about property and other people's rights than I saw 
some of the cruddier rich people who obviously didn't acquire it uh, uh, through their own efforts in most cases. But, you know, there was one case, you know, you could do, we, we would go all the way down from a murder case to a shoplift case. There's one guy, he bought something in a big box. This guy, he makes a half a million dollars a year and he's shoving, he's doing a little, a, a series of petty thefts by shoving merchandise into the box, paying for the item in the box. We ca we caught him. But whether it's a rich guy doing a petty theft or a rich guy doing the son of a rich guy doing a murder for money, trust me, rich people commit crimes all the time. <laughs> and some and many, many poor people are some of the most morally principled that you'll ever meet. It's uh, the theft and crime are not the product of poverty. They are not. Uh, one's moral base and character has a whole lot more to do with it. But that was one of the bigger murder cases I did. I did another murder case. Well, I, I did a number of murder cases that got media attention, let me put it that way. Um, and in child abuse, some of my cases got attention if the child abuser was particularly nasty. Um, those, But uh, uh, serial child abusers and murderers get a lot of media attention and I think that's appropriate that they do. Uh, I, if I was a journalist, I would focus on the murders and the child molesters too, <laughs> if you see my point. Those are, in my view, the, in terms of the harm they cause, that I've seen in terms of the harm they cause, the worst kind of crimes that you can commit. Um, and, uh, but I also enjoyed doing, uh, when, the, when I first became a prosecutor, we had to determine its sentencing in California had just become the regime. So there's a lower term, midterm, and an upper term assigned for each felony, unless it's a life offense. And so if you don't get felony probation, the judge has got to give you three, four, six, or three, six, nine, five, 10, 15, whatever the three sentence range is, he's got to give you one of those. For a mitigated case, it's the lower. For an aggravated case, it's the upper. When I became a DA, the upper term on rape was eight years. Oh, what's messed up? That's the aggravated case? Now, I know not all rapes are the same, but the aggravated rape is eight years? That's ah, messed up and too low. Most Californians agreed. So when I was at the DA's office, the California legislature and the voters approved the one-strike rape law so that if there was torture, binding, residential burglary involved in the rape under certain circumstances you could get 15 to life or if it was really egregious 25 to life for a rape and now i'm thinking now that's an aggravated rape sentence <laughs> okay now i know you've been in prison so perhaps my enthusiasm to get big sentences uh, is emotionally rubs you the wrong way but for me i've known I, plenty of guys i thought deserved big sentences believe me i did the first one strike rape case in san diego county and it was a difficult case. The victim was an 85-year-old woman who had been raped in her own home uh, pretty brutally. And she had dementia and could not, uh, by memory, identify her rapist. Fortunately, we had all kinds of other evidence. And that was, a uh, again, when you're doing the first one-strike rape case, it's going to get media attention. And, um, uh, well, doing the drug court got media attention. Uh, all the time got media attention because we were doing something new and unusual. And I was just the guy to go out there and defend uh, creative approaches to the drug problem. So um, I, after a while, I'd appeared, I was well known enough to the local media that I became a commentator on legal and political affairs on various local TV stations. And so I would, I, I haven't done it for for many years, but for several years, I was just one of the go-to experts on more than one local news station when they were covering local legal stories, local news stories. Uh, and, and that's where I first got exposure on the media. And I got a little taste of that. And I knew that com communicating, I wanted to do more communicating, find some form of public education that I could involve myself with because um, I enjoyed that. What's the biggest lesson you learned from all your years as a DA? Why? That's a really good question. I mean, you can see all the little stuff that I learned along the way about, about this. Um, evil is real. I am an American and I had great parents and I was a bit spoiled. I thought that the world was sunshine and lollipops when I was a kid. 
you know, the lady across the street was an immigrant and with her big thick accent, she said, I remember, I remember going back to the old neighborhood. Oh, sunshine face. Cause I was always smiling. Why didn't I smile? Of course I was smiling all the time. My life was idyllic when I was a kid. And so I had the problem of Dagny Taggart. I really didn't grasp the reality of evil. I did not. I, all I thought is all I have to do is that's what made me argumentative sometimes. Look, all I have to do is prove I can show you. I can argue. I can look my rash. See my beautiful rational argument that'll convince you. And I realized that it, it's not a question of the facts or the logic. There's such a thing as free will. And OK, I could get it sort of at the argument level. People are being willful, you know, their pride gets involved and they get a little stubborn one way or another. But people really evil. I mean, in terms of they don't care about their own life. They'd rather the value get destroyed than anyone have it. They're really indifferent to the suffering of other people, starting with themselves in a sense. Is that real? Is that real? I mean, I read Atlas Shrugged and I saw Dagny Taggart's moment. She sees James Taggart screaming for the death of, spoiler alert, I'm sorry. But you see, but everyone knows the climax of uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged and the events with Hank Reardon and then with her brother, James Taggart, that finally convinced Dagny Taggart that evil is real and that John Galt is right and that that's the only way to go. Um, I had to learn that. And I think nothing more than the DA's office uh, could get, I was so naive and innocent and benevolent and optimistic, so filled with the idea that everyone really, if they knew the good, they'd do the good. Sort of psychological egoism almost, right? Um, yeah, sure. If they knew it was good for them, if they knew the truth, if they knew it was right, why would, they would automatically do it, right? No, no. They're a minority. They're a minority. To get most people to do wicked things, they have to think they're doing a good thing. They have Socrates to... was wrong. I have to say that evil is real and that there are some people who hate their own life. And from that emanates a disrespect for other people's rights. And from that emanates a purely nihilistic uh, approach to things. Uh, I saw it, and I saw it more than once. Uh, people who just hated their lives so much, they were just destructive elements. Um, and um, there is real evil in this world. It's rare. It's rare, as I say, most of the time, for people to do rotten things, they have to think it's idealistic. But there are people who do, do hate their own lives such that they don't mind destroying the lives of others. Um, I saw it and I saw that that was the motive. And when I could see it like Dagny on the face of people, I had to sort of catch my breath at a reality I had never let sink in. There are evil people in this world. They will out of pure malice and hatred of their own life destroy without a thought destroy other lives um i don't ever want to see it again in anyone's face but i've seen it in more than one face so the biggest lesson was the one i needed to learn most and i had the the, the, the loosest hold on the reality of evil i'm afraid i was dagny taggart for a long time and the da's office got that out of me got that out of me i hate it sort of end on a sad note like that no, we're not gonna because i'm gonna ask you this before okay. i let you go <laughs> is there anything you'd like to tell us about being a da that i didn't ask or you didn't have a chance to, to talk about uh, yeah uh, if i can because it is we have been talking about it recently and if i had one more thing i would say it was my experience as a prosecutor that told me in a hundred different ways that if you really want to improve the situation with crime in America, legalize drugs, I know there are a bunch of other reforms we could do, but the single reform that would have the biggest impact would be to, and I saw it firsthand, organized crime gets their money. Where do they get their money? You want to get rid of the money in organized crime? Legalize drugs. What about all the people who are dying of fentanyl and heroin? You know, there are very dangerous, deadly chemicals that are sold in pharmacies every day, even over the counter. And yet the purity and quality and quantity of those drugs is known because they're legal. The deaths from fentanyl, the deaths from heroin that young people are experiencing today are the direct result of that law. That law, 
If you want to save the lives of young people who are dying right now in record numbers from fentanyl and heroin, legalize that stuff. If you want to dry up the money for organized crime, if you want to dry up the money from the corrupts law enforcement, where do you think that money comes from? We could double the effectiveness of our, because they spend half their time enforcing drug laws. Half the people in our prisons are there because of drug laws. We could double the effectiveness of law enforcement without spending a single dime, ladies and gentlemen. And people would, by the way, we would be respecting. See, I want to circle now back around to the rights issue. That the issue of individual rights and personal liberty is life and death. And boy, talk about getting the truck like reality of that. When you're a prosecutor and you see how counterproductive something like the war on drugs is, you know, I had a DEA officer giving uh, the, the DA's, you know, there's a law enforcement meeting they have to do with drugs and stuff. And I just confront him with the simple question Isn't it, isn't this drug problem trying, it's like trying to empty the Pacific Ocean with a thimble? And he said, That's exactly what it is. I said, I, I, why are we even trying? It's like King Canute and the tide. Give it up. You can't even win this war. And all you're doing is hurting people and killing people and funding organized crime. I don't know a lot of unemployed teenagers who can afford $1,000 semi-automatic guns if it weren't for the money they were making on drugs. No, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to really get a handle on crime, the single most important thing to do would be to legalize drugs. And I would say, while you're at it, legalize prostitution and gambling. It is those kind of black markets that create money for organized crime and local street gangs. It's those that corrupt law enforcement. It's those that make our law enforcement so ineffective. And by the way, the dubious search and seizure cases almost all come from th this kind of stuff, drug cases. So if you want a consistent enforcement of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments to the Constitution, get rid of the crimes of mere possessing something. No, I, I, that's what I would... That if, if I wanted to leave them with a little law enforcement lesson, that's what I, the law enforcement lesson I'd leave people with. Legalize drugs, people. It's the single most important thing we could do on the crime dimension. Well, that is a great lesson to leave them with. But we're not going to leave them with that because we're going to leave them with where they can find you. As you say, I'm active on Facebook. Almost every day there, I'm answering questions. At the Ayn Rand site, we're the largest and the oldest Ayn Rand page. At the John Galt line, I'm also an administrator there. The Leonard Peikoff Study and Appreciation page, I'm also an admin over there. But uh, that's not it. I'm also active on various podcasts. Most importantly, the Ayn Rand Center UK, United Kingdom. We're creating a worldwide community of students of objectivism. We're having wonderful conversations, the discussion that needs to happen to advance uh, the cause of philosophical truth. And so I do that multiple times every week. Uh, my book, Creating Christ, is going gangbusters. We have a documentary based on it now. I had never imagined that was going to happen. Available through Amazon Plus. Um, and uh, you can find that at www.creatingchrist.com. I've seen it. It's great. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'm writing another book on religion, uh, a broader broader take on religion uh, this time. So I'm uh, active, active, active. But if you want to get, get me, I'm always there just about every day on Facebook. Well, thank you very much for being with us once again, and we'll have you back very soon. For now, this is the Rational Egoist. I'm Mike, Rational Egoist. I'm Michael Leibowitz signing out. And let me know what you thought of this episode. If you have any questions, post them. I'll be happy to answer them. Till next time.